Hello and welcome back to a second season of Extraordinariness, a podcast about ordinary people who've accomplished extraordinary things. On this episode of Extraordinariness, Joe was lucky enough to speak with Lee Spencer, also known as the Rowing Marine. Lee served in the Royal Marines for 24 years and survived three tours of Afghanistan. After losing his right leg in an accident, Lee broke records by rowing across the Atlantic Ocean and from mainland Europe to South America, becoming the world's first physically disabled person to do so. Join us to hear Lee's inspiring story and learn about his next challenge, the Triathlon of Great Britain. My name's Lee Spencer, better known or also known as the uh, Royal Marine, a former Royal Marine amputee. I was on the website again this morning, just refreshing my memory about all these amazing challenges that you did. And I think it'd be really great if you could talk about how you got into rowing and the, the first sort of the, the one in 2015, the road to recovery. Was, was rowing something that you did prior to your accident or was this your sort of first entry into that sport? The first time I got into a rowing boat was in La Gomera when we got in the rowing boat for the first time before we rowed across. I've not done anything nautical before, no yachting experience, no open ocean experience and no rowing experience at all. So it was all brand new to me. So how did you get roped into doing this amazing challenge? <laughs> you know, I, well, I, I thought it was a, an amazing opportunity. It's in 2004, I was organizing an end of season party for the Royal Marines Commando display team and it took part in a centre bar in Paul and I was talking to it was a former Royal Marine who then ran the pub and he had this picture of a really odd looking boat and we'd finished discussing you know everything that we needed and I asked him about that and he said oh it's my boat I tried to row the Atlantic in and that was the first time I'd ever heard of anyone I didn't even know it was possible. He got halfway across and then I had to get rescued. But I, was, I sat talking to him snake for about half an hour and then got on with the rest of my life. And unfortunately, my leg fell off in 2014. And my... Tell us more about that accident, if you don't mind, like in terms of what, what actually happened in 2014. Well, I, I stopped at a accident on the motorway and was helping out the people who had crashed. And another car crashed into theirs and I was hit by an engine block. Took me right leg off completely from below the knee and completely dislocated my left leg. I spent six weeks in hospital. Then I went to Hasler Company, which is the Royal Marines Rehabilitation Company. And a couple of weeks after that, so probably about eight weeks after I first lost my leg, I went and to Headley Court, which is the rehabilitation centre for the military. And on my first day there, I turned up and there was a guy, he had no leg, both legs had gone. He was walking about on these odd looking pins and he had a big beard, which sort of stands out in the military. So I asked him about the beard and he said, I've just got back from rowing the Atlantic. And that was the second time that I'd ever heard of anyone or anything. We also asked, obviously sat chatting. It was a guy who was called Cal Royce sat chatting for ages like I was always asking questions throughout that and he it was obviously fascinating but it also sort of gave me the idea or let me know that just because I'd lost my leg wasn't necessarily an end mm -hmm. to uh, an adventurous lifestyle and then about a year after that that first admission I received an email from Blesma, the Limbless Soldiers Charity, asking for volunteers to put together the world's first all amputee crew. And Cal, who I met, he, he went with two disabled rowers and two able-bodied rowers, and he skippered us across in 2015. I just thought it was such an amazing thing to do that when I got the email, I jumped in and I made the next year, so my second year as an amputee, my complete focus was to make sure that I was a member of the crew and, and got a spot on that boat, which I was lucky enough to, to do. It was everything you can imagine in every way. It was frightening, exhausting, horrible, daunting, amazing. It, it was incredible. So it, it was like living life in extremes. Yeah. So things either were extremely beautiful or extremely scary or extremely tiring. And 
it was an amazing experience. The other thing is that when, when I lost my leg, I thought that the person I was, I was suddenly defined this and by what I could do physically, I thought they'd gone. And I'd have to redefine who I was because I was no longer that person who could define themselves in that way. So I was now disabled. But actually rowing across gave me that sense of self again. And I can't, it's really hard to explain how important that is and how fundamental to everything we do that sense of identity is. And it's something we all take for granted unless you've lost it. So mm -hmm. the first time actually changed my life. Definitely as significantly as losing me leg, in, but in a real positive way. Amazing. So from that first expedition in, in the team to becoming the rowing marine, talk me through that process. Well, it's, it, was, it was the first night, actually, that we got in. I said to my wife that I'm thinking about doing it solo. Straight off the boat, as in yeah. first night off. Oh, wow. Okay, so you got straight back on it. And then I started, it began to start thinking about where I thought I had to define myself by being disabled. So within the parameters of disability and how wrong I was, made me really think or really highlighted how in general, not always, but in general, we define a disabled person by their disability. And it just seems so unfair that like everyone should have the opportunity to be defined by something positive, not something negative. Whereas if you're disabled, it does tend to define who you are. People, you know, never say, do you know, Steve, and you say, Steve, oh, Steve, who's never likely to be an astronaut. But if you're disabled, then that thing that limits you does sometimes and often define who you are. And I really wanted to challenge that. And as I looked into rowing solo, it's a massive undertaking, especially it's not just planning, it's getting all the money, the sponsorship, and of course. it was real hard work. But as I started looking at that, I noticed there was a record that was set by a Norwegian in 2002 called Steinhoff. He rode solo and unsupported from Portugal to South America in 96 days, 12 hours and 45 minutes. And I thought that was gettable, that record. And I thought if I could be an able-bodied record in something that's physically demanding as rowing an entire ocean on your own, then that would set a massive, make a massive statement that no one should be defined by disability. So that, that was really the driving force behind it. I've got two, two real, um, drivers, passions, drivers, missions however you want to describe them. The first one is keeping wounded, injured servicemen in the nation's conscience. I feel passionate about that. I wasn't injured in service. I was helping out on the side of the road in the UK. I done three tours of Afghanistan and one of Iraq. Go through unscathed. But when I went through the recovery pathway with the military, I was face to face. I remember some of my best friends were triple amputees who have had their entire lives absolutely shattered. And I passionately believe that we as a society owe them a life with dignity, nothing more, just a life with dignity. And the further we get away from recent conflicts, the more put the drift into the back of people's minds. And it's, it's less charity for me, it's more a moral obligation. So that's the first thing that drives me is keeping wounded, injured service men and women in the nation's conscience, reminding them really of that debt that's out. And the second one is proving that no one should be defined by disability. And they were the real drivers and the real reason behind the second row. And well, they seem to really work. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, well, I, I beat the record. I beat it by 36 days. I, I Which is not, <laughs> no mean feat, Lee. That's quite significant. <laughs> that, 60 days, 16 hours and six minutes. I mean, that is just incredible. I mean, how did that feel? If I'm honest, well, flat. The last two weeks of the row, I hit the wall physically mm -hmm. from about two weeks to go. And the last two weeks were really, really grim because the mental gymnastics I had to go through to keep rowing sort of within a couple of days of becoming physically exhausted, I became mentally exhausted. And then, then I was emotionally exhausted. 
And when I actually finished and crossed the finish line, I had no emotions left, none. Couldn't, really have, couldn't be tired. That is exactly the best way of describing it is I had nothing, absolutely nothing, no emotions, no nothing, just completely empty. And in fact, it took about three months before I could start thinking about the row in a positive way. Those last two weeks were that awful. By far the hardest, hardest, difficult, most grimmest thing I've ever, ever done. Wow. Was... But, and you must have known, you know, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I've never rode an ocean, funnily enough. But you must have known that you were on track to really smash this record with how, far, how much progress you'd made. And Yeah, but the, the thing with ocean rowing, you only ever won bad road wave away from complete and utter disaster. Right. The only time, and this sounds like a cliche, but it really isn't, the only time when I realised, all right, I might actually do this, is when I could see the boy that signalled the start of the Mahuri River estuary. Once I crossed that, I'd gone into continent South America and crossed the finish line. So literally, it weren't done until I could see the finish line. And even then, I was it wasn't done. It was just, oh, I might, I might actually do this. It's incredible. It's, so that, why do you think it took so long to really recover from it and to sort of acknowledge this? I mean, it is the most extraordinary achievement. Those, those last two weeks were horrific. It was simple as that. It was that it clouded every thought I had about the road, which just clouded by those last two weeks. Well, and it, when you think of it now, do you, do you have you reframed it, or are you still thinking of the? Oh, no, 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 only about the first two, three months, right? But then, I mean, that was then. It was almost three years ago. It's <laughs> it was an amazing thing to do, but you don't sit there with a smug grin on your face thinking well I mean and lots of people would and I can't pretend that I probably wouldn't either so I think that you've been really humble here Lee <laughs> just get on with life don't you you know life carries on you can't just sit there thinking all the time about something you did once no I totally agree and that's a really really amazing way to look at it humble. I am very proud of the achievement Good. I am and but you know life just carries on. You can't mm. just, uh, you know, living on past logs. But I mean, it did lead to, you know, some pretty special opportunities. Didn't you speak to Prince Harry? Yeah, yeah. And he, he's really nice guy. Yeah, really nice guy. Seems to be getting hammered a bit at the moment. In <laughs> how, how, did, um, how did that come about then? With... Well, Harry's sort of. I had a lot to do with him, with the various military charities that he supports and never actually done Invictus guns. I've mm -hmm. always been busy doing something else whenever they've been on. Um, but he's really supportive of everything. It's not just me, it's other military veterans, veterans, wounded, injured servicemen and women. He's really, really supportive and anything he can do, he will do. Amazing. We've got the record-breaking role. And I remember I reached out to you last year when you were busy training for the, the triathlon of Great Britain. So would you mind talking us through sort of the, the from conception to execution, really? How did you come up with the idea and, and what happened? I actually had the idea about three days after I lost my leg. Really? I was, yeah, I was, I was on a, a lot of drugs. <laughs> what? So I'm thinking about, you know, I, I, what you got to know about us is that I am physically extremely unremarkable. And I mean that even though like to get in the Marines, I was turned down twice. Oh, really? 13. I, I, it was always my dream to be in the Marines. And I at 13, when you take your options, you had like a little bit of a careers fair. And there was a Royal Marine there. I went up and said, I want to be a Royal Marine. And he says, you you captain of the football team? He says, no. He goes, you're in the football team? He says, no. Rugby team? We didn't have a rugby team. And actually, football is, is a game that I've always played and enjoyed. But I'm just rubbish at it. <laughs> you're not what we're looking for. And then when I was 18, I went to the careers office. And again, I got as far as... Uh, the, the interview stage and they said you're not what we're looking for 
And I, I tried to get in cross country because I wasn't fast. Like as a kid, you think, well, if I can't swim, I must be good at cross country because that makes sense. There's a logic to that when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. And I tried to get in the cross country team and the trials and I came 53rd out of 90. Years. So when I say that I am physically unremarkable, I mean that. And I've got the scientific evidence to back that up because it's part of the triathlon and part of the training. There's a friend of mine who's a, a sports scientist that feel tested me VO2 max, like really accurately. And I'm bang average in the population. So I've got the scientific evidence to back that statement up. So when I finally got through the interview stage, then got into training. It's uh, part of the marine training, isn't it? The selection process yeah. is tough. I found it easy because you just don't give in. You just do what they tell you to do. And you just don't give in. It's really that simple. And it's, uh, it's, I suppose people would have a perception of what it's like, you know, people screaming at you and, and it's not like that the whole way through. It, it's all about self-motivation and like the court just like, we don't care if you do it or not. It's up to you. Yeah. But if you don't want to be here, there's the door. We don't care. So that kind of self-motivation I found easy mm-hmm. and I actually flourished in training and got through. And then I, I'd never, never have ever thought that I was physically adept enough to actually do something that would warrant people giving me money for charity. It's just something that had never, ever come across me, right? I'd never have thought that I was that person. And I actually uh, accidentally rescued a dog, a little puppy in Afghanistan. And it was, you know, it was tiny little puppy she was stuck between two fences it was nothing more than a natural human reaction and just reaching out and grabbing puppy and was like oh we've got a dog now what are we gonna do with this <laughs> there's a problem. the mum there was no mum or dad it was, just couldn't leave it and the cousin sent me an email saying put me in touch with the the charity now's that dogs that was in the, they were in the nose and the pull out a couple or not there's a former Royal Marine called Pen Farthing as well. So he arranged to fly the dog back, which he did, and actually became our family pet, Hannah. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I asked, you know, what what can I do to help? And he says, I'll oh, just try and make some money, do some do a couple of events. And I've done a, a bike in sport team first. And I really enjoyed it, really got into it. And I'd always wanted to run a marathon. I've never run a marathon. So on a, a Christmas Eve, I've done the fox cross-country one. So how long ago was this? This would have been about 2009. 2000, okay. The top was in 2008. Okay, but great. then I started getting into doing like long distance events. I found that I was, although I'm not particularly fit, I'm very good at plodding and just keep plodding and going. So six months before I lost my leg, I ran a double marathon over Dartmoor. So I ran 52 miles. A young who actually lived in the village where I live now. He dived into a snowdrift, drunk, and broke his neck. And uh, we sort of lo- local servicemen, a little group here, and, and, and the people in the village, we raised nearly £20,000. And then the right. whole charity came in with another 70 and paid for a robotic exoskeleton. And it was, it was so, if, such an incredible feeling. And when I lost my leg, that seemed like the natural thing to do is to carry on doing those challenges. So that's really the idea came about because I accidentally rescued a puppy. It was genuinely... That was your intro to the charitable world. Yeah, otherwise I would never have had the idea or that wouldn't, wouldn't have been anything that I would have thought of doing. But because I'd already been doing them for the, you know, first of all, for now, I was at Dogs, then I raised money for the British Legion and then the Royal Age Charity. I've done a few events for them. It's, it was a well-trod path. Yeah, natural progression for you to continue. Yeah, so when I was laying there, I was thinking, right, I need, need to challenge myself. What can I do? And I thought about doing a marathon. And I thought, well, lots of people do that with one leg. Then I thought about swimming. So you don't really need legs for swimming. And I thought about the channel and then I thought about the free peaks and it just suddenly occurred to me. I thought, well, that's a triathlon. 
isn't it? Mm. Swim the channel, cycle lads at the channel bounce and do the free peaks. So that's when I first had the idea. And then rowing sort of got in the way. And then mm. after it came COVID. And so actually it's been, what was that, nearly eight years in the country. Oh, really? Yeah, so I finally got to do it or try it in the summer, which didn't go the way as planned, unfortunately. Now, so talk to us, what, so when did you start and how far did you get along? What happened? Well, I, I got called forward. I swam Windermere, which was about eight, 19K, I think it was in the end. It was a lot colder and a lot harder because it's uh, fresh water, so you're less float, yeah. and, and that went well. So I was confident on the channel and I got called forward by my pilot. She had booked slots and they booked out years in advance. And because of COVID, I'd had my slot booked for about four years, I think, in the end. Yeah. I actually got down to the 70s. So the pilot rang us up and says, look, can you get down a day early? So looks like we've got a good weather window. So I went down to Dover a couple of days early. And I remember looking at the weather forecast and thinking, I can't see what he's this window that is pretty honking, the weather looks, but then you think, oh, well, they know what they're talking about. So that's what they do day in, day out. And I got in, started swimming, done a mile and a half in the first hour, which is about my pace swimming. I swim about a mile and a half an hour, which is my plodding. So I was looking at a long swim anyway, 18 to 20 hours to get across. Wow. But I can do that. It's, I don't mind doing that. It's just... Literally, and the way I was thinking about it is, is as long as you're going forward, you're going to get there, you okay. know? And the second hour, it just felt more difficult. And I kept getting swept away from the boat as well. And I was coming up, like, to, to take a breath. And, like, my face would still be in water. And I was like, which was wondering why that was happening. And then, then the next breath. You have to come right up, which forces your legs down. So basically, you're putting the brakes on every your stroke. And then I was fighting to get my left arm out of the water. So I'm pushing it forward into a stroke, like throwing it forward. And it wasn't out of the water. Well, I didn't really like, well, I wasn't able to know because you, you, you're not really aware of it when you're swimming. It's like the wind had picked up quite badly and there was quite a lot of big waves really quite choppy and then about halfway through the second hour I started getting a real pain in my shoulder and in my elbow and uh, so I asked for painkillers at the first at the next you stop every hour to get some food and water down here and also because I can't tread water when you're feeding I kind of I'm lower in the water than what anyone else would be because I've only got one so I can't tread water without using my arms and if you're using an arm to get some fluid standard with some carbohydrate and electrolytes. And because the waves were, were suddenly quite big now, they were kind of washing over me and I was going under water a lot trying to get the, the food and, and drink in me. And then I set off again into the third hour. And I think in that third hour, I think I only done 0.4 of a mile. And I just couldn't, it's just going nowhere. And the elbow and shoulder were getting worse. And if I was about two thirds of the way across, then there's, you know, you grizz it out and keep going. But there was no way. There was no way I was getting across. And actually, no. it, when I got out of the boat, I looked at the sea and, and then looked at the cliffs. I, I'd only done about three and a half miles. But I was, I was astonished that I'd even gotten that far. In this I know. Stuff. Hey, so was yeah. there no point where the this nice weather window that was you know waved in front of you was was there any chance you could have waited or started again when the weather got better? How does it work? It's because you booked in with a slot. Right. If, if you they, if you're washed out, as in you don't get a chance to go, then they try and fit you in later on in the year. Right. They can't fit you in, then they then you go back to the next year, and. Different boats operate a different system. And the pilot on my boat, you had three days and that was you. That was your window. Yeah. What other boats do, they say have, have like a six day window, but they'll have six swimmers and you'll be either number one, two, three, four, five, or six. Gotcha. You're number six in that window, then unless you get a rule perfect, 
you ain't going to get across. So then you'll go into the next slot as like, you might go in at number five or six. So it's really, really, really difficult to get those windows and get a good window. And I went, you know, I, I, I took it that he was a subject matter expert on the weather in the channel mm -hmm. and it may well have been swimmable for a really good swimmer, but I'm not that swimmer. I'm, you know, a good swimmer will get across in 10 hours, 10, 11 hours. And that's a good swimmer. I was looking at about, you know, 18 to 20 hours. Together. Did you have to start doing lots of tra swim training for it? Yeah, yeah. To to get across the channel, you've got to dedicate your life to it for yeah. a year. Well, until you get across. Very few people actually ever get across in their first go. Well, I mean, it's it's, it's not for me, Lee. I'm not going to lie. It's the idea it makes me feel a bit anxious, to be honest. So I'm, I'm okay with that. You just close your mind to it, don't you? And, and mm -hmm. you just one arm in front of the other. If you can do that. I remember on the first row, as I said, like the most nautical thing I've done at that point is probably go across the tour point very drunk. And then all of a sudden I'm in a tiny little rowing boat in, you know, out of sight of land and waves all around you. And we just, the routine we was working was two on, two off. You'd get a knock on the cabin and say, 10 minutes, and that'd be your 10 minute call. And it was either the first or second night, I can never remember. And I just went into a panic attack because I started thinking, I can't do this. And then the, I started thinking about the arrogance of thinking you could just get in a boat and row across the Atlantic with no experience whatsoever. And I really, it took every scrap of moral courage I, I possessed to actually get out of that cabin and start rowing. But once I did, and again, it's a massive cliche, but as soon as I pulled on the oars, it disappeared, just realized that actually I can do this. All I have to do is get out of that cabin every four hours and just do that for two hours. I mean, anyone can do that. And the cliche is when you break up, if you think about the whole thing, no one would ever do anything. Mm -hmm. Don't, you just concentrate on that next step, that next step, that next horizon, or even sometimes just putting one foot in front of the other and you can do anything. And is that very much your sort of ethos when you approach these challenges, break it up? Yeah, yeah. I, because if you do think about them in total, then it just become overwhelming. And, and you know, you, you, you put yourself in, in a position where, you, where you're talking yourself into uh, failing before you even set up. But it's, why can't you swim the challenge? I, I can I know I can just keep going and going and going for hours and hours and hours. I, I can do that. And swimming the channel is no different. It's just putting one arm in front of the other, trying to keep your technique as, as clean as possible mm -hmm. and just getting the fluids and the, and the carbohydrates down there. Yeah? The only thing that's going to stop you is if you get swept into, like the current takes you or the tide takes you into one of the, what they call the shipping lines. Right. Because there's, there's a couple of boys that signify where the shipping lanes going into Calais are and you can't be there. So the Coast Guard will, will call up and end it for you. Okay. But that's out of your hands. You can't sit there worrying about something that's not in your hand. Cool. The other thing is, is the cold. And last year, this summer that's just gone was particularly hot. So it's actually the sea was really warm. Yeah. So what's next then? Are you, you going to give it another go or are you shelving it? What, what's, where's your head at now? Still processing, failing it because I didn't get very far. On, I, I carried on with the triathlon. So I got down to Dover as quickly as I could. Cycled round Dover. I got from Dover to Land's End as quickly as I could. And then cycled round to Snowden. Got them down to Snowden. Then I cycled round to Scarfield Pike. And it was actually the room from Snowden round the Scarfield Pike, my stump where your prosthetic attaches to it, it, it fell apart and it, it was just open wounds it was, and I just couldn't put my leg on. I managed to get up and down Scarfield Pike, but then it was, it was just, you know, I, I, it stopped, you know, okay. if it's, you know, it weren't pain. So I, I had sores on my bum. Like, I hope this was. So it was quite grim. 
that you can deal with pain. You can put that to the back of your head and just carry on. You're quite good at doing that. But when your prosthetic won't go off or you can't put your prosthetic on, then you're done, you know, because yeah. you're, you're so reliant on it. So it was quite hard failing and still processing it now. But someone said to me, my nephew actually, he said, well, you got further than anyone else has ever got. That's true. true. And I, I think you, you keep using the word sort of fail and I, I wouldn't really see it as a fail at all. I still think it is the most extraordinary. Oh, no, no, it's definitely a, definitely a failure because if you set out to achieve something and you don't achieve it, then you fail. That's language. You know, you can't redefine what failure is. Hmm. And then just, you know, you can look on the bright side, you know, raised an astonishing amount of money, nearly £90,000. I mean, that is incredible. Really amazing. And which charities did you raise the money for this for this event? It's for the Royal Marines charity, which is yeah. my charity, the one that I'm associated with. And the other, the, going back to your question about revisiting it, the problem is booking the channel again. Yeah. And, and it'd be really hard. I'm, I'm, I might get a slot the year after next. It'd be doubtful I'd get a slot next year. So you really look in 20, 25, 26 to get a slot for the channel again. And I couldn't dedicate another year of my life where everything podcasts, they have to go out the window and you just have to concentrate solely on getting across the channel to get back down to Dojo and look out, you know, when you're done and think I'm getting across again. Let's <laughs> take a little. You've got a state of the weather. That would be really hard. However, I am swimming the channel as part of a relay in August with a friend of the Bauer Foundation, which is a good friend of mine. I met him at Headley Call. He had a stroke. He was a Royal Marines officer, an SBS officer. He had a real bad stroke. And a foundation supports people with, with servicemen and civilians, anyone with brain injuries. And I'm swimming the channel with them. It's part of a really lot team. And on the back of that, I've spoken to them. And if it doesn't detract too much from what they're doing, I'm going to do the rest of the try myself. And I think they're, they're talking about doing it with me, which would be pretty cool. But I'd have to approach it differently, the cycle. I think I'd have to cycle for two hours, then stop for 20 minutes to protect my stump. Otherwise, it will just break down again. Yeah. And I guess because you've got that experience now, you kind of have a better indication as to how to, to look after yourself on this kind of event, right? So the other thing is as well, it's not just dedicating your life to training for the channel. You've got to raise a lot of money and it's hard work trying to get companies to give you money, to believe in you, to believe that you can do something. And, and raising the money to do it is really hard as well. I mean, it is incredible, really amazing. So one thing we always ask all our interviewees, and I guess it's trickier for you because you've not just done sort of one event, you've got a whole host of them, but we talk about the pit and the peak. So we talk, you know, the sort of the highest point and the lowest point. So over the course of the last few years following your accident, since the road to recovery, the rowing marine and the, the triathlon, you know, what's, what's been your highest point and your lowest point? Or are you able to sort of isolate? I try not to think about things in terms like that. There's a couple of fundamentals that we can never change. One of them is we can never go back. So if you do take the moment I woke up in hospital with one leg as a low point, and even that I'm not too sure because I, I was just so glad to be alive. I knew how close I'd come to dying. Mm -hmm. I had to get, well, I think we probably only had the time to talk about it. I had to get a, a Rastafarian called Frank from Acne to help me get a tourniquet on them. That didn't work. I got his daughter to stand on me femoral artery and shut the blood down. And I'd lost over half my body's blood. And I was inches from death. And I knew I was. So when I woke up in hospital, I was just so glad to be alive. Well, I'd lost my leg. But that was so irrelevant. And then every day after that, I was able to do something I couldn't do the day before. So everything's been a positive. 
So if you take like fundamental principle of the universe is at the moment we can't go backwards or can't go back and change anything. It's hard to think of life in pits and troughs. And the other thing is, is that you can't be happy all the time. It's, it's impossible because that becomes non happier. I was in the, I was in the desert. This is years and years ago. And it was a big, long exercise in the empty call, well, the Amani desert. Like during the day, it was like over 100, 120, like from 11 o'clock to two o'clock, you just got under a poncho and just laid there because you couldn't do anything. And it was really hard, so did you. And we was living in a, so when we was not on exercise out in the desert, we was in a tented camp in the desert and they had, well, the showers, it was basically just water bowsers. And I'd gone for a shower, we'd been out for about a week long exercise. Come back in and I'd shower and get all the grit and sand out of my hair when I had hair. <laughs> and then I was walking back to my tent and someone said, Is there a drink? They've got uh, cans of drinks. I was like, hey, they get out of it. I actually swore. And I went, No, honestly. I went, No. And then I saw someone walking past with a can of Coke. I went, Oh, and I went up to the galley tent, was just really at a boiling vessel. We you put your boiling the back at rations. They weren't cooking any food. They hadn't mm-hmm. had any rations for months. And there was a queue of people. You saw the queue, signed your name, and you got given a can of Coke. The unit had gone somewhere, and they were cold. And I dropped, walked away, drinking this can of Coke, and I just had a shower and a can of Coke. And I thought, life don't get much better than this. Then I, then I suddenly realized, how rubbish is my life at the moment? Where... <laughs> That's the highlight. Yeah, and, and, and a shower. And I think that all my Christmases are come at once. That's when you realise that, you know, it's, you, you've got all these things. So, oh, I'll, I'll be happy. Once this happens, then everything's sorted, then I'll be happy. But it's never there. It's all relative, isn't it? Yeah, and you're chasing something that doesn't exist. It's not real. Those, those, we try. You say, right, I'm going to do this and that will make me feel like this. This... But those feelings only exist within you. Everything else that's out there that's not you, you've got very little control over that. It's the reality you haven't. By trying to make that outside influence inside, it, it's nonsense. Only you can change the way you feel, and that's inside how you do that. So that's, so I don't, Try not to. I think it's really quite unhelpful, actually, to think of life in pits and troughs because it's not like that. No, you're right. It's a very, you know, it's an amazing philosophy that you've applied to your outlook and uh, really inspirational, really amazing. I know from day one of waking up, everything's been a positive. It's also a thing that just so bloody lucky being here anyway. The chances of us being here, every one of us, are like billions and billions and billions to one. You know, this short amount of time we get to experience this thing, the universe, reality, whatever it is, it's just so lucky that we've got the chance to do that. Then, you know, it does seem a bit of a waste to mope about. <laughs> it's good, it's true. Thank you for listening to this episode of Extraordinariness. This season, in order to fit more of our guest stories into the show, Joe and I aren't going to break down each episode. But needless to say, Lee's Don't Mope About should certainly go into our extraordinary toolbox. The show was produced by myself, John Harmon, and hosted by Joanne Spence. Music was by Coma Media, courtesy of pixabay.com. And a big thank you to Lee for taking the time to talk to us, and to you for taking the time to listen. If you've enjoyed the show, please tell your friends about it and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes.